Let's find out how it all started for Anthony L. Ray, as your mama would say, and we'll find out how one of your hit songs sounds a lot like one of my originals, like I'm gonna need some royalties to hit my mailbox at some point. Sir Mix a lot. <laughs> yeah, don't duck out and disappear. <laughs> All right, before we get to that, uh, you know, I want to talk about how you grew up because how you grew up is what basically uh, gave you the foundation for your creativity. We talk about rap being what you saw outside the door. Uh, you were born Anthony Ray, raised in Seattle. Your, your dad was a sheet metal worker. Your mom was the nurse, but she was a single mom. That meant tough times that taught you some good lessons. Yeah, and she was a tough lady. I mean, she was, wasn't only a nurse, she was a nurse at the King County Jail uh, for years. And uh, then she moved on to hospitals and things of that sort. Never complained, always kept her head up. And uh, by the time I hit like 17, 18, I realized this is the strongest person in the world. Wow. You know, and I, and I really started to uh, try to mold myself in her image. I yeah. Really did. Yeah, you know, it, the stereotype of rappers uh, is, is just that. I think a stereotype. You're some of the most successful people in the business. But your mom, at the same time that you had a tough environment at times, or a tough situation, I'll say, uh, she wanted to make sure that you were well-educated. She sat you for, in front of the TV and made you watch news. Yeah, when, when CNN started, I think around 1980, um, I, I, I knew... I knew the policies of almost every Democrat and every Republican on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I, did I understand that, I understood how it affected us uh, and, and stuff like that. She this did not want me. She said, I don't want you to be in a barbershop, honey. And you're the only guy that can't spell, you know, ridiculous. Yeah, because that's how you, that's how you'd sound if you couldn't. So, um, yeah, she she made sure I kept my nose in the books and she had to fight that influence that existed right outside the door. Yeah, was, absolutely. That's, that's and and you had this kind of itself. thing in you. You either roll with the punches or get rolled over. Uh, speaking of, yeah. you were part of an integration uh, in the school's process uh, in Seattle. And it's one of those things that a lot of people from the outside looking in said, this is awful for kids. And although there are some things about it that just weren't right, you decided to see it as an opportunity. How did that impact your childhood? Um, it, I had access to some things I probably wouldn't have otherwise had access to. And don't get me wrong, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> waiting at a bus stop at five o'clock every day was not easy. But as I, as I got a little older, especially right when I graduated, I started to get into music then. And I had access to some tools I wouldn't have otherwise had access to. So I just did the best with what I could, uh, did the best of what I had at the time which was access. And I didn't have that same access when I went back home. So I would stay after school and play with pianos and the, the first iterations of synthesizers and things of that sort. I would stay after school and play with those things uh, until I had to get home. Cause yeah. I get home after dark, I had to, I had to meet that hot wheel track my mom used to hit me with. <laughs> And then, but getting up at 4.15, talk about establishing a work ethic, right? Uh, one of your childhood interests besides music, and it kind of all goes together eventually, you loved gadgets. Like she would get you a walkie-talkie right. and you'd take it apart and put it back together again. My mom got me a walkie-talkie. I took it apart because I was trying to see who was inside. So we had yeah, two different minds going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was really into that stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I still am to a certain extent. I work on RF amplifiers for ham operators and stuff like that right now even. Um, so I, I got into electronics before I got into music because electronic music was just kind of breaking. Um, and so I got to hear a group called Kraftwerk one time and I saw them and I'm like, wait a minute, they don't have a drummer, they don't have a bass player? I can do that right there. Yeah, because you know they mean? had a I synthesizer. Band. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so. Super cool, okay, yeah, your first are. rap song, I, I think you need to bring it back and you need to open at Rodeo Houston, uh, the square dance rap. Yes, and, and this is interesting. Houston plays a, 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 a serious part in my, my beginnings because Square Dance Rap hit here first. Posse on Broadway hit here first. My Hoopty hit here first. Those three songs blew up in this area, so I was down here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're legendary down here. All right, sir, mix a lot, uh, your name, because that's what you were doing when you were DJ in lots of places. Uh, you were mixing it up in so many different ways, whether it was mixing up with your voice, uh, with the equipment, the whole bit. Okay, so uh, breaking into music and actually performing, you played a number of places, London's uh, Wembley Arena, uh, you, with Dr. Dre, Grandmaster Flash, and then your debut album rec was recorded in your bedroom. We talk about the music from the streets. What's so interesting to, about rap to me is that in the beginning, how much the executives dismissed it until they saw hundreds of millions of dollars were being made across the country with this so-called street music. Yes, you're exactly right. And we, we jumped into it with both feet, we being the artists. And honestly, 
we didn't know much about business and it, and it showed in the early years, not a lot of licensing opportunities, things of that sort. However, we did play catch up. And uh, now I believe we're the highest grossing music on the planet. Yeah. And, and guys are cashing in on it. Guys like Drake with the beat steal. I mean, where would that would that have happened without hip hop? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so, so you you did my posses on Great Day and you just mentioned how much time you spent in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. All right. My posse is on Broadway. Yeah. So the reason why I said my posse is on Great Day is because I believe that what you did was lifted my song because I came out a year before you with my posse on Great Day and your song sounds eerily. So in fact, I'm, I'm going to let people judge. I'll let you judge. Here it is. My original video before yours came out. Take a look. Yo, yo, yo. It's Madam Mix a Little. My posse's on great day. Ralph is acting EP, Travis comes on strong. Line producing shows and stringing me along. I'm calling up producers to do their thing. Connie, Emma, Kira, Brittany make the show sing. Frank is calling shots, rolling pitches and sound. Chris and Adam out, rolling all around town. If you're looking for a way to start your day, this is what I've got to say. My posse's on great day. My posse's on great day. My posse's on great day. I swear she stole my posse's song. on great day. I think she stole my song. Yeah. No, 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 Mr. Mix. I think you stole my I, song. Came out the year before. I'm just gonna need some Benjamins to hit my mailbox and all is forgiven. I, I, okay. I have my attorney. <laughs> I have my attorney on right now. She's seen she's seen all of this and, and she's coming for you. She's coming well, for you. If she comes for me too bad, she ain't gonna get no money from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you had your later releases, uh, beepers, my hoopty, Mac Daddy, all those terms that we remember from that time. And then comes yeah. along, baby got back. Tell us how that came about. Um, you know, it's kind of weird because a lot of people thought that Baby Got Back was like my first hit and it actually wasn't. Um, no, your first hit was my song, My Posse's on Great Day. That was your first one. Yeah, the, yeah, the one you stole from me. Yeah, yes. yeah. We'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, we had Posse on Broadway, we had My Hoopty, we had Beepers, and, and, and those songs were big. And Baby Got Back wasn't supposed to be a hit. It was supposed to make a lot of people mad. It, it eventually did, but I think I kept it fun enough that people didn't understand what it meant. But sisters knew exactly what it meant. Yeah. And, and that was that was really what what I wanted to happen. And it did. And it got banned while it was number one. I love that. That that made it iconic and, and won the Grammy in 93. Right. Yeah. It got, yeah. Got a Grammy. Uh, oddly enough, while it was banned. Gotta love it. Yeah. And the whole point was to celebrate curves, because the idea of beauty, as we know, was kind of the stick uh, thin figure that we saw in magazines and, and commercials. And that was the idea of beauty. And you challenged that idea of beauty and said that that's a much wider uh, bandwidth than, than, than we were giving it. All right. Earned over one hundred million dollars. Uh, that was one of the things that 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 you talked about, the royalties and stuff like that earlier. You, you can live off of that one song alone. Uh, but the day it went number one, you were on tour and you realized the impact that it had. Yes, I was in Panama City, Florida. Keep in mind, this is this is when cell phones were like two dollars a minute, so I, I wouldn't go run around with that thing. <laughs> so I, I get in the I get into Panama City. I had this on video, so it's definitely not exaggerated. Um, and we're walking, and I'm holding a camera because I'm wondering why all these people are in this hotel next door, lined up to the. I mean, people couldn't get in the in the show, and I'm wondering what happened. Somebody die or something? Come to find out the song had gone number one that day and the club owner tells me on camera when i say why is everybody crowded up over here and he said because you went number one wow four days ago and i didn't know we were on the tour bus and didn't even think about it and it was it was surreal i could not believe it and i never thought the song would go number one especially because it was banned i'm like well that, that's probably and it. that's exactly like, no. the reason why i went number one it's an enduring yeah. legacy you've had uh, you know the song pops up all the time uh Nicki minaj uh did it all right you love encouraging new artists. You love performing in intimate venues because you're uh, much closer to people. And so speaking of the last time you were in the Houston area, I believe it was uh, two days before COVID shut everything down, but you're back now. And tell us about the show that you're going to do tonight. 100% um, live. And when I say 100% live, I, uh, what I'm so sick of seeing with a lot of artists rapping over your own lyrics. 
really? <laughs> it's like, you know, my thing is if I stutter, if I mess up, let it be live. Right. Right. And, and, and that's what I want to do. So I do 100% live. I interact with the crowd. I literally will look at somebody mouthing a song and say, do that song and I'll do that song next. I mean, I, I want it to be really alive. And I got that from a, a Marvin Gaye accidental show that I went to. Uh, and I say accidental in that he sang at the big venue, but we couldn't afford to be there. So he came to the hood and did another show just for us. And he was half horse. His voice was out, but he worked and he worked and he worked and he worked and he stayed yeah. there an hour and a half with no voice. I said, you know what, if I ever make it, that's kind of what, what I want to do. I want to be able to go to a small venue and deliver something truly live and truly memorable, hopefully. That is awesome. You'll be at the Wildcatter tonight. Uh, you know what, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna let you off the hook on the other thing. It just, let's let bygones be bygones. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, Teresa, um, she said that she'll, she'll back off also. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for joining us this morning and look forward to your show tonight. All right, I hope you get there. <laughs>